It's Monday, December 19th. The January 6th Congressional Committee recommends the Justice Department criminally prosecute former President Trump on four counts, including inciting or aiding an insurrection. Ours is not a system of justice where foot soldiers go to jail and the masterminds and ringleaders get a free pass. Never before in U.S. history has Congress referred a current or former president for criminal prosecution. Former movie mogul Harvey Weinstein found guilty of rape at his second sexual misconduct trial. Thousands of asylum seekers are massing at the southern border, hoping they'll be allowed to enter Wednesday when the Trump-era Title 42 restrictions are set to expire. A Supreme Court ruling on the issue will likely come at the last minute. Britain's high court rules the government's plan to deport asylum seekers to Rwanda is legal. San Francisco State Senator Scott Weiner back with another attempt to decriminalize the use of certain psychedelics proven to help veterans and others suffering from PTSD. My nights were sleepless with anxiety. My days were paralyzed by depression. Thank goodness I found psychedelics. And scandal-plagued South African President Cyril Ramaphosa re-elected head of the ruling African National Congress. From the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Pacifica Evening News. I'm Eileen Alfandari. The House January 6th committee has recommended the Justice Department pursue four criminal charges against President Trump, the most serious being insurrection. It will ultimately be up to the Justice Department to decide whether to prosecute Trump and other top-level officials inside and outside the government. Today's action is historic. No other U.S. president has been the subject of a criminal referral from Congress. Christopher Martinez filed this report. Ours is not a system of justice where foot soldiers go to jail and the masterminds and ringleaders get a free pass. Democrat Jamie Raskin of Maryland says the January 6th attack on the Capitol involved hundreds of individual crimes. And at the committee's final hearing, he presented criminal referrals for former President Donald Trump, along with some others who allegedly helped Trump's efforts. We believe that the evidence described by my colleagues today and assembled throughout our hearings warrants a criminal referral of former President Donald J. Trump, John Eastman, and others for violations of this statute. The statute in question is one against obstructing an official proceeding of the U.S. government. In this case, the peaceful transfer of power. Another referral is for conspiring to defraud the United States. A third is for making false statements, referring to Trump's attempts to seat false electors in states that he lost. The fourth and final referral is for inciting or engaging in an insurrection. Anyone who incites others to engage in rebelling, assists them in doing so, or gives aid and comfort to those engaged in insurrection is guilty of a federal crime. The committee believes that more than sufficient evidence exists for a criminal referral of former President Trump for assisting or aiding and comforting those at the Capitol who engaged in a violent attack on the United States. The committee also made a referral involving witnesses who refused to cooperate with the committee's investigation. They were not individually named, but the number includes several sitting Republican lawmakers, namely House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy of California, Jim Jordan of Ohio, Scott Perry of Pennsylvania, and Andy Biggs of Arizona. None of the subpoenaed members complied, and we are now referring four members of Congress for appropriate sanction by the House Ethics Committee for failure to comply with lawful subpoenas. Besides the referrals, the committee's 10th and final hearing included a video summarizing its year and a half of work, along with statements from committee members who raised other issues. California Democrat Zoe Lofgren talked about attempts to affect the testimony of witnesses. In particular, she talked about Trump's online fundraising of hundreds of millions of dollars. 
The proceeds from his fundraising, we have learned, have been used in ways that we believe are concerning. In particular, the committee has learned that some of those funds were used to hire lawyers. We've also obtained evidence of efforts to provide or offer employment to witnesses. Democrat Elaine Luria of Virginia talked about the committee's findings on dereliction of duty, referring to Trump's failure to take action during the insurrection. In summary, President Trump lit the flame, he poured gasoline on the fire, and sat by in the White House dining room for hours watching the fire burn. And today, he still continues to, flan to fan those flames. That was his extreme dereliction of duty. The committee voted to adopt its final report on its investigation. Committee Chair Benny Thompson, a Democrat from Mississippi, says the report will be made public later this week, and the bulk of the committee's work will become public before the end of the year. Meanwhile, as the committee was meeting, a trial began for five Proud Boys charged with sedition, and another defendant was charged with plotting to assassinate federal agents who investigated him. The committee will formally dissolve with the end of the legislative session, but Chair Thompson says the matter is far from over. This committee is nearing the end of its work, but as the country, we remain in strange and uncharted waters. We've never had a president of the United States stir up a violent attempt to block the transfer of power. I believe nearly two years later, this is still a time of reflection and reckoning. If we are to survive as a nation of laws and democracy, this can never happen again. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Karen Breenberg is director of the Center on National Security at Fordham Law and author most recently of Subtle Tools, the Dismantling of Democracy from the War on Terror to Donald Trump. She told Letters and Politics host Mitch Jezerich what happens now that the committee has made its recommendation that the Justice Department pursue criminal charges against former President Trump and others. The Department of Justice now begins its process of, you know, convening a grand jury, deciding whether to prosecute in, in what time frame and going forward like that. I think what's really interesting here is the range of charges that have been put forward because the incite assist or aid and comfort to an insurrection, which is really the, the one I wasn't quite sure they were going to pr provide, is really one that goes to the heart of, I think, what happens. And I think a very important charge that, that they brought out. And I think it really says, look, we understand the gravity of what happened here. We're not backing away from what what the threat to the country that went on. I think in terms of the other charges, I think they are ones that are not um, necessarily overreaching and definitely were to be expected, particularly obstruction of an official uh, proceeding. And, you know, there are, there are all different ranges of what can happen in terms of fines, in terms of imprisonment, in terms of not being able to run for office again, for example, on the insurrection charge. So the bottom line is they delivered in a way that was not um, overreaching, um, but that talked about some of the lower hanging fruit in front of charge in terms of charges. And, and the larger takeaway of insurrection. What, what's the likelihood, you think, now? Again, this, the, the, it, this does have significance to it. Congress is, has investigatory powers. Congress does have the power of subpoena. Again, it has conducted its own investigation here. However, these referrals don't, don't force the Department of Justice to do right. anything. What it's currently doing, it's its own investigation. Do, do you think these referrals matter in that sense? And what can we, do you think we can expect from the DOJ? And the DOJ now has uh, Jack Smith, who's doing it, who's heading the investigation there. What, what, what do you anticipate happening next there? You know, it's hard to distinguish what uh, I might anticipate happening with what I, I, I think should happen. 
Um, I think the DOJ will take this and Jack Smith will take these things. A lot of their work has been done for them. And while we've seen these subpoenas that Jack Smith has put out in the past couple of weeks to the number of states to get their emails, et cetera, and communications during the um, in the immediate aftermath of the election, I do think the DOJ, I'm expecting the DOJ will go forward with these. I think that they will that they have a much of the evidence they already need and what Congress has collected and also what perhaps they have collected on their own in their own investigation. I expect they will go forward with this and I expect they will do this in a, an aggressive way in terms of understanding the timetable that they're up against and that we're already, you know, in the two years run up to the 24 election. Karen Breenberg, director of the Center on National Security at Fordham Law. The January 6th committee's written report will include legislative recommendations to prevent a repeat of the Capitol insurrection. One proposal would clarify the strictly ceremonial role of the vice president in presiding over the electoral count. It would also make it harder for Congress to disregard a slate of presidential electors from a state by raising the threshold for an objection from one member of each chamber to at least 20 percent of members from both chambers. John Nichols is the Washington correspondent for The Nation magazine. He says the committee should have laid out its legislative recommendations today to the public, as well as the criminal referrals. What did concern me a lot about today's hearing was that it was so very focused on Trump and Trump associates, uh, and there was no, in this final hearing, no focus on recommendations as regards policy and systemic changes, up to and including uh, examination of whether we should have an electoral college, which was so central to this, this mess. And I think in that case, in that area, the committee made a mistake. I think that today's hearing uh, went very quickly. They focused very much on those criminal referrals against Trump. I understand that that's going to be the big news, the highlight, but I think a better way to have done today's hearing would have been to add an extra hour uh, and do uh, an examination of recommendations for what Congress could or should do structurally, not about individuals, not about personalities, but structurally to assure that, that a crisis of this sort does not develop again. Media reports say that House Republicans are planning to release a rebuttal report of their own following the publication of the January 6th committee's final report on Wednesday. That will be the opening salvo of what's expected to be a laser-like focus of Republicans and the likely new Judiciary Committee Chair Jim Jordan to launch investigations of the Biden administration, Biden's son Hunter, and to try to discredit the work of the January 6th committee. Former President Trump has thrown his support to Republican House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy to serve as the next House Speaker. In an interview with Breitbart over the weekend, Trump told the handful of far-right House members still opposing McCarthy's leadership bid that they're, quote, playing a very dangerous game. There are still five Republicans opposing McCarthy. They are Arizona's Andy Biggs, Matt Gates of Florida, Ralph Norman of South Carolina, Matt Rosendale of Montana, and Bob Good of Virginia. Jury selection has begun in the seditious conspiracy trial of former Proud Boys National Chair Enrique Tarrio and four other members of the extremist group charged in the attack on the Capitol. The process began today after the judge denied defense attorneys' last-minute bid to delay. The defense had pushed to postpone jury selection until after the new year because of the action this week by the House January 6th committee. The trial comes just weeks after two leaders of another extremist group, the Oath Keepers, were convicted of seditious conspiracy. That case was seen as a major, major victory for the Justice Department's extensive January 6th prosecution. Jury selection in the Proud Boys case is expected to last for several days. This is the Pacifica Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno. I'm Eileen Alfandari. The U.S. Supreme Court has temporarily blocked an order that would lift Trump administration pandemic-era restrictions on asylum seekers. But it is leaving open the prospect of lifting the restrictions by Wednesday when they are supposed to expire. The order by Chief Justice John Roberts 
came as conservative states are pushing to keep limits on asylum seekers. The states appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court in a last-ditch effort before the limits expire. In his one-page order, Roberts granted a stay pending further orders and asked the government to respond by 5 p.m. tomorrow. The order by the chief justice means the high-profile case that has drawn intense scrutiny will go down to the wire. Meantime, thousands of asylum seekers are packed in shelters on Mexico's border near El Paso, waiting for the restrictions to expire. After going through so many things, we will finally be fine after being kidnapped and going hungry. We hope to be better. After what happened to us, we are afraid. I feel that I will not be able to live in peace. I want to stay here in Mexico working, but I won't be able because of what happened to me. We want the United States government to help us, to help us as they have helped us so far. My colleagues and all the people who are here because we need that help. We are asking President Biden because he's the only president who will help us. We know he will open the door for us. The Democratic mayor of El Paso, Texas, declared a state of emergency over concerns the city wouldn't otherwise be able to provide shelter and resources to the thousands of asylum seekers arriving at the border. And I really believe that today our asylum seekers are not safe as we have hundreds and hundreds on the streets. And that's not the way we want to treat people. And um, by calling it a state of emergency, it gives us the ability today to be able to do things we couldn't do until we called it, and that's our shelters, and put people in shelters and make sure that they're safe. But we have ordinances that uh, keeps us from putting a lot of people in certain buildings. We can do that now if we can do it a safe way with the uh, fire department and, uh, and proper personnel. Immigration advocates had sued to stop the use of Title 42 to limit who can apply for asylum. They said the Trump-era order went against U.S. and international obligations to people fleeing to the U.S. to escape persecution. Advocates have argued that things like vaccines and treatments for the coronavirus have made the health-based policy outdated. Judges at Britain's high court ruled the British government's controversial policy to send asylum seekers on a one-way trip to Rwanda is legal. But two judges also ruled that the government must consider the circumstances of the individuals it tried to deport. The ruling is a partial victory for the government, but is likely to face further legal challenges. Several asylum seekers, humanitarian aid groups, and a border officials union filed lawsuits to stop the conservative government acting on a deportation agreement with Rwanda that aims to deter migrants from crossing the English Channel in small boats. Giles Gibson reports. Judges at the High Court said the UK's agreement with Rwanda is consistent with the UN's Refugee Convention. But the court also said that Priti Patel, who was Home Secretary when the policy was introduced, had not properly considered the circumstances of the individuals due to be sent to Rwanda. The policy was unveiled back in April, but the first flight in June was stopped by a last-minute injunction. NGOs and charities have vowed to fight the policy all the way in the courts, with no flights expected any time soon as appeals work their way through the legal system. Giles Gibson, London. Jurors in Los Angeles have found Harvey Weinstein guilty of rape at his second sexual misconduct trial. The verdict following a month-long trial represents a victory for the Me Too movement five years after the former movie mogul became its central figure. Lacking forensic evidence or eyewitness accounts of the assaults that Weinstein's accuser said happened from 2005 to 2013, the L.A. case hinged heavily on the stories and credibility of the four women at the center of the charges. Jurors could not reach a verdict on two accusers' cases, including the allegations by California Governor Gavin Newsom's wife, first partner Jennifer Siebel Newsom. The jury deliberated for nine days. Ultimately, it found Weinstein guilty of rape, forced oral copulation, and another sexual misconduct count involving an Italian model and actor who said he appeared uninvited at her hotel room door during an L.A. film festival in 2013. A mistrial was declared on the charges involving Siebel Newsom and another woman. Weinstein was acquitted of a sexual battery allegation made by a massage therapist who treated Weinstein at a hotel in 2010.
Weinstein faces up to 24 years in prison when he is sentenced. He's already serving a 23-year sentence for a rape and sexual assault conviction in New York. Negotiators reached a historic deal at a United Nations Biodiversity Conference this morning that would represent the most significant effort to protect the world's lands and oceans and provide critical financing to protect biodiversity in the developing world, though some environmental activists said it did not go far enough. Laura Macon Isherwood reports. The agreement sees at least 30 percent of the world's land and oceans being put under conservation in the next eight years. Here's the EU's climate spokesperson, Tim McPhee. This is the Paris moment for biodiversity, where the world sets goals and targets to protect and restore nature for current and future generations. Laura Macon Isherwood reporting. Increasing the size of protected areas to 30 percent by 2030 might not be that difficult or that significant since currently 17 percent of land and 10 percent of marine areas are protected. That's 27 percent. The agreement also calls for a redoubling of efforts to conserve threatened species, minimize the impacts of climate change and reduce pollution. But the delegation of Greenpeace International at the summit called the agreement weak and an open invitation to greenwashing. The Greenpeace representative said in a statement in its present shape, it won't halt biodiversity loss, much less reverse it. Friends of the Earth International said it was deeply concerned about the way the biodiversity framework was adopted and warned that the corporate capture of the convention made reaching the kind of deal the crisis demands impossible. Friends of the Earth's Forest and Biodiversity Coordinator said the text does not stipulate any regulation on corporations and instead promotes greenwashing measures which will allow for offsetting of environmental destruction. The environmental activist said it also does not stop the destructive advances of agribusiness, which is the main driver of biodiversity loss, and rather it promotes agribusiness through concepts such as sustainable intensification and innovation. Multiple drones have targeted Ukraine's capital in an attack before dawn, though no serious casualties were reported today. The drone attack came three days after what Ukrainian officials described as one of Russia's biggest assaults on Kyiv since the war started. Sarah Coates is reporting from Kyiv for Future Story News. She said residents are weary but defiant in the face of the Russian barrage, which has plunged them into darkness and cold. They're worn out, but let me tell you, they are resilient. I've been speaking to so many people on the ground and they say they can endure these conditions. They will endure these conditions. What they will not put up with is Russian occupation. There's been a lot of centres, they're called these uh, points of invincibility set up right around Kiev. These are either makeshift tents powered by diesel or petrol generators inside. They have hot tea and coffee and a little bit of something to eat. Russian President Vladimir Putin traveled to Belarus today for talks with its authoritarian leader, President Alexander Lukashenko. The Ukrainian government has said it faces the realistic possibility of a second Russian invasion from the north, from Belarus. Russia has thousands of troops in its nadir purportedly doing training. John Pfeffer, director of foreign policy and focus, appeared on on front and con- up front in conversation with host Brian Edwards Teeker. Pfeffer says the relationship between Russia and Belarus is close, but President Lukashenko has so far drawn the line and says he won't send Belarusian troops to fight for Russia in Ukraine. As Lukashenko looks at what is happening inside Russia, the pushback against the war. Um, the negative consequences for Russia of, uh, of invading Ukraine, he certainly is not interested in seeing that happen inside Belarus. He has faced over the years successive waves of protests uh, that have very nearly um, upended his administration. Uh, so he knows that his position in power is perilous and a war like Ukraine or involvement, more direct involvement in a war like Ukraine could prove to be a tipping point for his own control uh, of power. Well, Russia has already like used Belarus as a staging ground for, for launching missiles 
airstrikes uh, and and one ill-fated land invasion of Ukraine. Has there been any sign of domestic discontent over that? There has been. I mean, we've, of course, seen that there are kind of clandestine um, operatives, Belarusian, Belarusian operatives, uh, that have worked on behalf of Ukraine, um, launching kind of cyber uh, attacks to disrupt communication um, uh, among Russian actors in the war. Um, I think there's a big difference between serving as a staging ground and actually sending your own troops uh, into battle. Um, that is, you know, it's one thing for, I mean, even for Russia to conduct an aerial attack on Ukraine, um, but sending the soldiers into what they themselves have called a meat grinder in Ukraine uh, has proven to be, you know, a red line for, for many people, not only the soldiers themselves, uh, who many of whom have refused either to go or to serve or have simply left the country uh, before being called up as well as their families. John Pfeffer is Director of Foreign Policy and Focus. You can hear the entire interview on this morning's edition of Upfront, which is archived online at kpfa.org and also available as a podcast. The remaining 36,000 striking graduate student workers at the University of California have reached a tentative agreement with the UC for increased pay and benefits that could potentially end the month-long strike. The bargaining unit says some workers could see raises of up to 66 percent over the next two years. The union UAW Local 2865 says the contract could provide UC's lowest paid workers with an 80% wage increase. The strike is the largest of its kind in the nation and disrupted classes at all 10 UC campuses. It was watched by public universities across the country with academic workers that have been taking on roles once reserved for tenure-track faculty, but without the same pay and benefits. The agreement still needs to be ratified before the strike officially ends. Voting on the contract began today. The contract would last through May 31st of 2025. The agreement comes weeks after the UC system reached a similar deal with postdoctoral employees and academic researchers who make up about 12,000 of the 48,000 who went on strike. That agreement will hike pay up to 29 percent and provide increased family leave, child care subsidies, and lengthened appointments to ensure job security. UC graduate student workers have said they can't afford to live in the cities they work in with the current salaries. Areas like Los Angeles, San Diego, Berkeley, and Santa Cruz, where housing costs are soaring. San Francisco Democratic State Senator Scott Weiner has reintroduced a bill that would legalize certain psychedelic drugs in California. Under the bill, the possession and use of drugs like magic mushrooms could be decriminalized. Pamela Estrada reports. The bill cites some studies from medical universities that have found evidence that psychedelics could be used to treat certain mental health issues like depression and substance use issues like alcoholism. Substances like psilocybin, psilocin, dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, and bogine would be decriminalized under SB 58. These substances are found in drugs like magic mushrooms, ayahuasca, and peyote, among others. SB 58 is an update to a similar earlier bill that failed to pass. This version of the bill excludes synthetic psychedelics such as LSD and MDMA, known commonly as ecstasy. Senator Weiner says this version of the bill has the votes it needs to advance. We're always working to build the coalition and make it even broader, and I'm optimistic that that'll happen. Uh, this time, but just to be clear, the we, we we the problem with the bill, the problem the bill encountered last time was not a lack of votes. Chair of the last committee uh, just gutted the bill and made it not worth pursuing, that, so it did not fail for lack of votes last time. Weiner said the war on drugs has failed and has a disproportionate impact on the poor and minorities. Weiner also supports opening safe use sites in cities like Oakland and San Francisco. Some California cities like San Francisco, Oakland, and Santa Cruz have decriminalized the possession of natural psychedelics. Weiner says his bill does not include a provision 
for allowing people with drug convictions to have their charges dismissed. The, the bill does not include an expungement provision. Uh, if the bill passes and is signed into law, um, mm -hmm. we will certainly look at doing a follow-up piece of legislation to create an expungement process. Um, we typically usually don't do those in the same bill because it um, makes the process a little uh, harder. Decriminalization is different from full legislation. The bill would not authorize the sale of these psychedelics, but would stipulate that police cannot arrest individuals for possessing or using limited amounts of psychedelics. Clinical psychologist Dr. Nathaniel Mills backed the measure. He says the personal stories he has heard of people who have benefited from the use of psychedelics are backed by scientific evidence. The medicines outlined in this bill are naturally self-limiting. Even in animal studies, subjects who take psychedelics once are reluctant to try it again. These medicines have been shown to be effective in helping treat substance dependence for other substances. These are not recreational. These are plant medicines and decriminalizing them will create the opportunities to heal for the people who need it the most. The California District Attorney Association opposed the measure. A representative emailed a one-sentence statement saying, we will certainly oppose. The bill will face its first committee hearing and legislative vote in the spring. For KPFA News, I'm Pamela Estrada. The Justice Department is taking action to end sentencing disparities for different forms of cocaine. Attorney General Merrick Garland wrote in a memo to federal prosecutors that he was directing them to begin leveling the same charges for powder cocaine and crack cocaine. He noted federal law has imposed harsher sentences for crack, creating unwarranted racial disparities. Civil rights leaders and advocates for criminal justice reform say the laws have taken a heavy toll on black communities and applauded Garland's change, but called on Congress to act to end sentencing disparities permanently. The disparity originated in a bill President Biden introduced when he was a senator in 1986. More from Catherine Carley. Supporters say they're optimistic about a bipartisan bill to cut the gap in sentences for possession of crack and powdered cocaine. Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey says the Equal Act would make the criminal justice system more racially fair. We will not let this fall to the grind of bureaucratic politics. We will not let this end because this is an issue of justice. The new sentencing guidelines would apply retroactively to those already convicted. Crack has the same effects as powdered cocaine, but carries much harsher sentences and has been more common in communities of color. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, one of the richest people in the world, launched a poll asking Twitter users if he should step down as leader of the company. More than half of the 17 and a half million users who responded had voted yes by the time the poll closed. There was no immediate announcement from Twitter or Musk about whether that would happen, though Musk had said he would abide by the results. Musk attended the World Cup final Sunday, where he was seen with Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. The CEO of MyPillow and fervent Trump supporter Mike Lindell is back on Twitter. Elon Musk reinstated him. Twitter had permanently suspended Lindell's account in 2021 for making repeated false claims about the 2020 presidential election and violating the platform's policy on misinformation. In his first tweet following reinstatement, Lindell thanked Musk and called for melting down electronic voting machines and turning them into prison bars. In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa has won re-election as leader of the ruling African National Congress Party. The vote was narrower than expected, with Ramaphosa winning nearly 2,500 votes to his opponent's nearly 1,900. Still, it was a welcome victory for Ramaphosa, who has been mired in a scandal. He has faced calls to step down as president of South Africa and to be replaced as the leader of the ANC. Gary Kai Chaunza reports. President Cyril Ramaphosa's re-election comes as his opponents in and outside the ANC party are demanding he resign due to allegations he abused the office in a corruption probe related to money laundering at his farm in 2020. 
Ramaphosa's spokesperson Vincent Magwenya says the president's re-election shows that the ruling party has confidence in his leadership and he can now advance government policies he initiated the last five years in office. All the good work and the solid foundation that the president has um, tirelessly spent energy uh, working on will now be sustained and be carried forward for the benefit of not only just governing party members but for the entire country. But the results show a divide in the unexpectedly close race between Ramaphosa and challenger former health minister Zuele Mkize, who is aligned with former president Jacob Zuma. Voting for the party's leadership took much longer than scheduled, stretching out over the weekend. Skumbuzo Kulu is Mkize's campaign team leader. I welcome the, the, the outcome of the, of, the, of the conference. I am happy. This, this was the race. It was a fair race. We welcome the results. There is always next time. Uh, don't give up. Go back to the province and then we'll come back. We'll come back. We're happy. The ANC conference was marked by bitter divisions and scandals surrounding Ramaphosa, Mkize and other party leaders. With crippling nationwide power cuts of over more than seven hours a day, an unemployment rate of 35% and widespread reports of corruption, Ramaphosa and the newly elected ANC leadership have many challenges to address as the party leading the government and the legislature. Mkize ally and police minister Bekitele blames disunity in their camp for his loss. That's what we agree upon, that we'll go back and work on ourselves and find one another and work going forward. On the eve of the ANC Congress last week, former President Jacob Zuma said you initiated a private prosecution against Ramaphosa. Zuma is accusing Ramaphosa of unfairly influencing the justice system's prosecution of Zuma for corruption related to a $2.5 billion arms deal. On Sunday, Ramaphosa responded and gave Zuma an ultimatum to withdraw the legal challenge, which Zuma has since ignored. Mswane Lemanyi is the Jacob Zuma Foundation spokesperson. He insists that Ramaphosa should defend himself in court. This is just a PR exercise, just so that you guys, you can think Ramaphosa sit on top of the tables. He's still in charge. No, he is facing a criminal case. This is what it is. He is a, he's an accused in a criminal case. He is charged. A judge is waiting for him on the 9th of January. That's, that's the situation we have. Last week, Ramaphosa survived a vote to start impeachment proceedings against him over a parliamentary report that said he may have broken anti-corruption laws by keeping undeclared sums of dollars at his farm and failing to declare their theft. For KPFA in Grahamstown, Eastern Cape, South Africa, this is Garikai Chaunza reporting. Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte has apologized on behalf of his government for the Netherlands' historical role in slavery and the slave trade. Today I apologize on behalf of the Dutch government for the actions of the Dutch state in the past, posthumously to all enslaved people who have suffered from that act worldwide, to their daughters and sons and to all their descendants. His remarks appeared on Al Jazeera. Ruta made the formal apology despite calls for him to delay the long-awaited statement. Some activist groups wanted him to wait until next year's July 1st anniversary of the country's abolition of slavery. Ruta told reporters after the speech that the government would not offer compensation to the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of enslaved people. Instead, it will establish a $200 million fund for initiatives to help tackle the legacy of slavery in the Netherlands and its former colonies and to boost education about the issue. More than 600,000 African men, women, and children were shipped to the former Dutch colony of Suriname in the northern portion of South Africa by Dutch slave traders. The director of an organization called the Black Archives did not attend Ruta's speech despite being invited because of what he called the almost insulting lack of consultations with the black community. He said it was a historic moment but lamented the lack of a concrete plan for reparations. The Dutch first became involved in the transatlantic slave trade in the late 1500s and become a major trader in the mid-1600s. Eventually, the Dutch West India Company became the largest transatlantic slave trader. 
North Korea says it fired a test satellite on an important final stage test for the development of its first spy satellite. That's a key military capability that leader Kim Jong-un has prioritized. The North's state media said the test was done to assess the satellite's photography and data transmission systems. Meantime, South Korea, Japan and U.S. authorities said Sunday they had detected a pair of ballistic missile launches by North Korea. Again, Jaguti Darbe reports. Pyongyang launched two more ballistic missiles on Sunday, according to both Seoul and Tokyo. They're believed to be medium range as they flew more than 300 miles from North Korea's east coast, according to authorities in Japan. The Japanese defense minister said the rockets fell into the sea outside the country's exclusive economic zone. Japan and South Korea condemned the tests, and the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command reaffirmed what it called America's ironclad commitments to the defense of these two nations. North Korea has fired an unprecedented number of missiles this year, including a long-range Hwasong-17 ICBM last month. Days ago, state media reported Pyongyang had also tested a solid-fuel high-thrust engine, which could enable faster launches of ICBMs. Jagruti Dave, Washington. The United Nations Secretary General today touched on a number of global issues facing the world body during his annual year-end news conference. Among them, the climate crisis and the war in Ukraine. Max Pringle reports. Guterres told reporters that 2023 will be a year that the international body will focus on ending conflicts and dealing with environmental threats to the planet. I am more determined than ever to make 2023 a year for peace, a year for action, as we cannot accept things as they are. We owe it to people to find solutions, to fight back, and to act. But Guterres did say that he's not optimistic about the ongoing war in Ukraine ending anytime soon. We have no illusions that uh, a true peace negotiation uh, would be possible in the immediate future. Guterres referenced an agreement reached among negotiators at the COP15 Biodiversity Conference in Montreal that wrapped up Monday to halt the destruction of plant and animal species by decade's end. We are finally starting to forge a peace pact with nature. This framework is an important step for determined diplomacy, and I urge all countries to deliver. But, Guterres said, for all the progress being made on some environmental fronts, the international community is well short of its greenhouse gas emission goals. We are still clearly moving in the wrong direction. The global emissions gap is growing. The 1.5 degree goal is gasping for breath. National climate plans are falling woefully short. However, Guterres insisted that the trend can still be reversed. He said advanced economies have agreed to assist developing economies to become less reliant on fossil fuels. And that, he said, is an encouraging sign. We are not retreating. We are fighting back. And we are fighting back to help emerging economies shift away from coal and accelerate the renewable energy revolution. Guterres said he will convene a climate ambition summit next September which will invite representatives from governments, NGOs, and private industry to come up with new and concrete emission reduction proposals and goals. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. This is the Pacifica Evening News on KPFA Berkeley and KFCF Fresno. This newscast airs each night at 6 with a half-hour edition on the weekend. You can find the full newscast and selected reporter pieces at our archive at kpfa.org or subscribe to the Pacifica Evening News as a podcast. I'm Eileen Alfandari. This is Brian edwards Teekert. Every morning on Upfront, we give you a window into what's happening in your community and around the world. It's a mix of reporting, interviews, and debates where we ask hard questions and make room for thoughtful answers from City Hall to Ukraine, pretty much everywhere in between. Start your morning with Upfront at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now!, right here on KPFA. An entryway to Central Park in New York City has been dedicated to remember the injustice that imprisoned five black and Latino teenagers after they were wrongly convicted of the 1989 rape of a white jogger. 
The entryway on the northern perimeter of the park flanking Harlem is now known as the Gate of the Exonerated. Raymond Santana was one of the five. Over 300 articles have written about us within the first two weeks of this case, dissecting the lives of 14- and 15-year-old kids. The labels Urban Terrorist, Wolfpack, Wilding. Those are the labels we were given. Ken Burns said that we was considered the five most hated human beings on the planet Earth. As 14- and 15-year-old kids. Today was the first time that Santana, who's now in his 40s, has returned to Central Park since that fateful day 33 years ago. The five then-teenagers were wrongly tried for the rape of the 28-year-old woman whose brutal attack left her with permanent injuries and no memory of the assault. The high-profile incident prompted police to round up black and brown men and boys in connection with the rape. Matthias Reyes, a murderer and serial rapist already in prison, would later confess to the crime. Soon after that confection, a confession, the convictions of the Central Park Five were thrown out in 2002 after they had served from 6 to 13 years in prison. One of the other men, Kevin Richardson, said, It needs to be known what we went through. We went to hell and back. Richardson said, We have these scars that nobody sees. President Biden's administration is making a new push to reduce homelessness. The initiative comes as the nationwide point-in-time count. There were more than half a million homeless people in the country, 582,000 people without housing earlier this year. That was an increase of less than 1 percent from the last nationwide tally that was conducted in early 2020 before COVID-19 hit the country hard. The federal initiative seeks to drive down the count by 25 percent by the year 2025 through efforts to house people who are homeless and prevent others from losing their homes in the first place. The federal plan highlights racial and other disparities that have led to inequity in homelessness. It seeks to expand the supply of affordable housing and improve on ways to prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place. The new survey finds that Los Angeles has overtaken New York City as the city with the largest homeless population. Homelessness grew in L.A. from 64,000 in 2020 to more than 65,000 this year. Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass took office this month and promptly declared a state of emergency. The count found homelessness declined among veterans, families, children, and young adults. Most were staying in shelters, though the number of those sleeping in places not intended for habitation rose. More people had been homeless for more than a year, and black people continued to be disproportionately homeless. KPFA's Christina Onestad spoke with Eric Tars, the legal director at the National Homelessness Law Center, about the Biden administration's new policy. The first glance at it is uh, it's got it's got all the right pieces and it, for the first time, names housing as a basic human right to which all Americans should be entitled and sets an ambitious goal of uh, a reduction of by 25 percent in the next two years of, of homelessness. Um, It is on the right track for sure. It's very responsive to much of the input that was given over the the course of this past year. The government uh, invited feedback from groups like ours, as well as people directly experiencing homelessness. Um, And what we told them in large part was that it needed to come out and and address housing as a basic human right for every American, which it does. Um, We needed to Uh, address the growing criminalization of homelessness uh, across the country, which uh, takes resources away from the actual solutions to end homelessness um, and instead puts further barriers of fines and fees and arrest records in the way of people getting out of homelessness. Um, And it does that. How does it do that? It really focuses in on unsheltered homelessness and uh, the growth of encampments across the country and emphasizes that we cannot end homelessness by simply pushing uh, encampments around, trying to get them out of public view. Uh, The only way to actually end encampments is to end the need for encampments. If we aren't addressing the underlying needs of people who are living on the streets, then they are there. Those needs continue to exist. Then everybody needs a place 
to sleep and shelter themselves. Uh, so if we don't address those needs, people will continue to shelter themselves and to sleep <laughs> uh, in places that aren't planned for them. So it's always better for a community to have a plan uh, for where every single person in an encampment that they might want to close is going to go. Um, otherwise, those people will end up somewhere else and you will have wasted resources trying to push them out of this one place uh, to somewhere else. Um, and it calls on uh, each of the 19 federal agencies that are part of the U.S. Interagency Council uh, to think about what steps it can take uh, to encourage communities to act in those ways, incentives, whether it be funding um, or enforcement from the Department of Justice or, or other strategies uh, to help encourage communities in that direction. And um, uh, it needs to confront the uh, racial inequities in homelessness, uh, and it does that, um, and, and propose equitable approaches uh, and solutions. And needs to uh, really focus in on the evidence-based, uh, data-driven approaches of uh, housing first and making sure that everybody has enough uh, access to deeply affordable housing on the, the prevention side uh, of the equation. And uh, for the first time, this plan to end homelessness, uh, which, which has we've seen previous plans before, um, but this one is, is new and unique in that it actually talks about the prevention side as well as getting the people off the streets who are already there. And as we know, you know that's really the, the cause of growing homelessness across the country. The homelessness systems that we have in place uh, in many places are working actually decently well, but there are more people entering homelessness every day than are going out. And so if we don't fix the prevention side of things, then as much good work as, as homeless service agencies are able to do, uh, they'll never be able to keep up with the demand. Eric Tars is with the National Homelessness Law Center. He spoke with KPFA's Christina Onestead. Meantime, the American Civil Liberties Union of New Mexico and others are suing the city of Albuquerque to stop officials in the state's largest city from destroying homeless encampments and jailing and fining people who are living on the street. The lawsuit filed today accuses Albuquerque of violating the civil rights of what advocates describe as the city's most vulnerable population. The lawyers claim Albuquerque has initiated a campaign in which city personnel hound and harass people who are homeless. The complaint blames the city's own policies for causing a housing shortage, along with escalating home prices that have put ownership out of reach and have resulted in more pressure on the rental market. They also point to the trend of institutional investors buying single-family homes and renting them at sky-high prices. A letter signed by 25 Democrats in the House urges greater funding for the National, Rabel, National Labor Relations Board in the year-end funding package, which must be completed by the end of the week. The letter follows a request earlier this year from members of Congress for beefed-up funding. It comes amid a flurry of union organizing and with it a flurry of worker complaints to the NLRB. Silicon Valley Democrat Ro Khanna sent the letter to House and Senate leaders last week. Catherine Carley reports. Representative Ro Khanna of California says Congress needs to protect the rights of American workers by better funding the National Labor Relations Board. So all the folks are out there standing with the wonderful Starbucks organizers, the Amazon organizers. They won't succeed if the NLRB isn't funded. Kana says $300 million more so the NLRB can work through a backlog of labor rights cases is crumbs compared to the almost trillion-dollar defense authorization bill. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. California community colleges suffered a major decline in enrollment when the COVID pandemic hit. A new report from the Campaign for College Opportunity looks at how a handful of the state's community colleges, including in Berkeley, were able to buck the trend by supporting their students and keeping more of them enrolled. Suzanne Potter reports. During the pandemic, California community colleges lost 19 percent of their enrollment. But as a new report shows, a handful of schools bucked the trend. Researchers with the Campaign for College Opportunity found that some schools had smaller losses or even added students by focusing on equity and by expanding outreach. Colleen Moore is a higher education consultant who interviewed dozens of college administrators for this study. 
All the colleges I spoke with talked about expanding financial supports in some way through things like transportation and book vouchers as a means of helping low-income students stay enrolled. I'm Schools Suzanne also Potter. relied on data analytics to see where students were stopping out and then refined course schedules, curriculum, programs, and institutional policies to better meet student needs. They also increased partnerships with local employers to offer students a path to a job after graduation and tried to create a more supportive campus culture. Moore adds that many of the schools expanded their efforts to reach out to current, former, and prospective students. Some people talked about explicit efforts to divide up their lists of students to contact based on race or ethnicity and assigning the list to staff that share that background as one aspect of their efforts to make their campus more welcoming to all students. The nine schools that either had smaller enrollment losses or added students include community colleges in Barstow, Berkeley, Clovis, Folsom Lake, Moore Park, Sacramento, San Diego, Visalia, and West Hills. Support for this reporting was provided by Lumina Foundation. For Public News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. New protections are coming to parts of the Oregon coast, which is rich with life from coastal birds to creatures such as sea stars. Eric Tegatoff reports. Six stretches of Oregon coast that are home to a diverse array of wildlife are set to receive critical protections. The Oregon Ocean Policy Advisory Council approved new rocky habitat designations for the areas, including Chapman Point and Ecola Point, both of which are north of Cannon Beach. Jesse Jones is the Coast Watch Volunteer Coordinator for the Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition. She says the areas have seen increased visitation, which puts the fragile but vibrant landscape at risk. Jones says Chapman Point, for example, has large boulders teeming with life. Numerous black oyster catcher nests and is a resting place for harbor seal pups and adults and has truly incredible rocky habitat, intertidal diversity, including numerous marine invertebrates, plants. Chapman Point is set for designation as a marine education area, and Ecola Point, which is just to the north of Chapman Point, is set to become a marine conservation area. The areas contain tide pools and are home to nesting habitats for some of the world's most threatened birds. Jones says the beauty of the process to protect these regions is that it has been community-driven. The proposals were made and initiated by members of these communities in which these sites are in. And these community members worked very hard to study these sites and get these proposals in. The decision now goes to the Oregon Land Conservation and Development Commission, which is expected to approve the new designations. Along with the other four designations, the new protections are part of an update to the state's Rocky Shores Management Strategy, which hasn't been changed since 1994. Support for this reporting was provided by the Pew Charitable Trust. For Oregon News Service, I'm Eric Tegadoff. A Nevada judge has blocked that state's pardons board from considering a request from outgoing Democratic Governor Steve Sisolak to reduce the state's 57 death sentences to life in prison without possibility of parole. The board of pardons, which includes the governor, will still meet tomorrow morning as scheduled, but will not discuss the commutations. A Carson City judge said from the bench that the board has the authority to issue commutations but failed to properly notify the families of victims before the meeting. The outgoing governor confirmed last week he wanted to clear the state's death row before he leaves office in two weeks by reducing the sentence of of all prisoners awaiting execution to life in prison without parole. Nevada has not carried out the death penalty since 2006. Tomorrow will be another spare the air day in the San Francisco Bay Area due to wood smoke that is especially harmful for children, the elderly, and those with respiratory conditions. The designation bars Bay Area residents and businesses from using their fireplaces, wood stoves, pellet stoves, outdoor fire pits, or any other wood burning devices. High pressure over Northern California has trapped wood smoke at ground level, leading to unhealthy air. The forecast for the Bay Area. Lows tonight in the lower 40s. Tomorrow, partly cloudy skies with highs in the upper 50s. In Fresno in the central San Joaquin Valley, a low of around 37 degrees tonight. Tomorrow, high near 57. A big thank you to all of you who put a bow on our year-end holiday fun drive. It was a tremendous outpouring. If you didn't have a chance, you can still make an online donation at kpfa.org. I'm Eileen Alfandari.
Tune in Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today with host Walt Turner. At 8 p.m., it's Transitions on Traditions, a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power that comes your way with host Greg Bridges. At 10 p.m., end the night right on Don't Disturb This Groove with host Computer Blue. That's Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.